Hello and welcome to the Sibsey West Midlands pod vlog and podcast. My name is Joss Brownlee and I'm joined today by Chloe Ag. Chloe, welcome. Great to have you here today. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Always a Excellent. pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> Chloe is a lecturer at the Mechanical Engineering Department of Imperial College London, where she teaches equality, diversity and inclusion in engineering, as well as design and professional engineering skills. Within academia, Chloe draws upon her many years experience in industry as an HVAC engineer, working at consultancies such as Cundall and WSP. She is the education officer for the Sibsey West Midlands region and also sits on the new Sibsey EDNI advisory panel. Chloe is particularly interested in well-being and has presented on this at the Sibsey and Ashray Technical Symposiums. Welcome, Chloe. Tell us a bit more about yourself. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure. And thank you for such a lovely introduction. Um, yeah, I started out um, doing mechanical engineering at university because I'd been very much told um, you, know, you like problem solving, you like maths and physics. Um, so that was the route I went down. But I had no idea about building services at the time. Um, and actually, my first job was in medical device design. Um, it wasn't really until um, I wanted to move away from, from Scotland, which was my first job, back to being nearer to the family because of some family issues at the time, um, that I found out about building services. So partly because that was one of the things I was starting to get involved with at work as on a graduate rotation scheme, but mainly because recruiters actually suggested it to me. So, you know, I might not have been here at all had it not been for, for some family emergencies and some wanting to, to change where I was. Yeah, I absolutely loved it ever since. Um, I find building services such a fascinating um, area to work in. There's always so much change and um, so many different things to think about. And it's so much about working with people. Um, yeah. And despite the fact that at school I wanted to be an engineer because I didn't like people, actually it turns out I do. I quite like talking to people. I like working with people. Um, so, yeah, I'm really glad that I've ended up working in building services and it's part of why I like doing things like outreach and stuff because I, you know I want to open up this world to so many other people I think it's going to be so important for the future as well um, but yeah and I want that world to be um, an equal and inclusive one so there's no point in encouraging people into the industry unless it's a, a good place for everyone to work so yeah EDI and well-being is my my other big thing that I'm passionate about as well. Um, Sibsi, you've got a Sibsi 125 challenge at the moment and, and the first uh, element of that that we've been challenged as uh, building services engineers, chartered, chartered building services engineers, is uh, um, to um, it is regarding STEM and outreach. So can you tell us a bit more about uh, any activities you're involved in there? Um, from STEM and outreach perspective, um, sure, I've just moved. Um, I'm at Imperial now, but I was at Warwick. Um, and at Warwick, I was part of their public engagement um, institution uh, that has recently formed. So I was leading people on, on how do we embed outreach into education. So getting more of uh, more educators involved with, with outreach. But yeah, it's something I've been passionate about for a long time. Um, you know, I started being a STEM ambassador when I was still at university, which is more years ago now than I care to think about. Um, but yeah, I, I seem sort of perpetually involved with um talking to my daughter's schools and things like that, which I think is an easy thing for anyone to get involved with. If you've got kids or nieces and nephews or just a school around the corner, you can go and knock on the door. Of. Um, but I've also been involved with some, some more national outreach. So recently was involved with the Royal Academy of Engineering project where we created videos um, for bedtime stories for very young engineers, which was delightful. So I, I created a story that was all about a building services engineer working in a chocolate factory which may be somewhat autobiographical, um, but also somewhat based on my daughter with her sparkly boots and tutus and things. Um, so, yeah, it's great to be able to do these things on all sorts of levels. I will say, though, Joss, we've talked a lot about me and we've not introduced you. So shall I uh, take a turn at introducing you? You are a fantastic m &E building services engineer with over 20 years experience in the construction industry graduating from Bolton Institute with a Bachelor's of Engineering Mechanical Technology degree. You started your professional career at a ventilation contractor in Cammock, Staffordshire, uh, before a few spells of, at a variety of consultants and contractors, and most recently working for a variety of main contractors. You are currently the chair for Sibsey West Midlands region, and you do a great job of that, so thank you very much. And you were thank previously you. chair also in 2018 to 19, and vice chair subsequently during COVID. 
Um, you are mechanically biased, but yeah, don't worry, we don't hold it against you. I am as well. Um, and you've got a keen eye for energy efficiency, innovation and sustainability. So back to you. Do tell us a bit about yourself as well. Yeah, well, um, that, that's uh, in a nutshell uh, who I am and, and where I've been. So, yeah, I've got a, a range of experience from um, uh, the theory uh, and hopefully the, the practice as well. Um, and yeah, very similar to you, you know, having that uh, inquisitive uh, problem solving sort of uh, mindset. Um, my father is a, a civil engineer um, and I knew that I didn't really uh, wasn't really um, uh, interested or, or uh, um, enthusiastic about um, highways and bridges and what have you. But uh, from a young age when he was taking me and my, my grandfather taking me marshalling at uh, various motorsport venues around the country, uh, I was very interested in, in cars and motor racing. And that uh, sort of mechanical side um, saw me go into mechanical engineering rather than automotive engineering or motorsport engineering. Um, and that's uh, sort of uh, where, where I went to. But uh, having done um, physics, maths and something else at a level which uh, escapes me at the moment but uh, yeah that that sort of uh, problem solving inquisitive sort of mindset uh, uh, led me to to go into to engineering and then uh, with the thermo fluids and uh, um, number number crunching and, and cad elements saw me uh, go into a, a ventilation contractor and look at uh, some uh, sort of um, pizza huts and uh, uh, outback steakhouses and restaurants and, and ventilation systems and then um, after that we're into a uh, M&E consultancy that started looking at some of the pipes as well as the wires as well as the ventilation systems as well so uh, yeah that, that's me in a nutshell. Fantastic and you've obviously got loads of engineering experience um, but more recently obviously your involvement in the committee so what prompted you to get involved? Um, so I've always been inspired by the level of qualifications that my father's got um, and uh, he's a, a chartered engineer um, I believe he's a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers as well um, and I always uh, sort of aspire to um, match or um, beat you know the, the uh, letters after his name of which I've got. That's familiar. Um, so um, yeah um, I started off by um, wanting to become a member of the institution that I'm, I'm, I'm a member of currently um, and then gain chartered status with uh, that institution. Um, but unfortunately, my degree is uh, not an honours degree uh, and it's also not a four year accredited degree either uh, by SIBSI or the Engineering Council. So um, I had to follow what was known or, or is maybe still known as the uh, alternative route to uh, gaining chartership. So I had to write a 10,000 word thesis or, or dissertation uh, and an engineering practice report um, and present those and um, answer some questions um, step by step. So I had to obtain membership to start with. Um, and then once I'd uh, obtained that, I then could apply for chartership as well. Um, so one of those was done within the region. Um, and I, I vividly remember where and, and who did that. So uh, thank you, Simon. And thank you, Eric, for uh, um, believing in me. Um, and then also uh, going down to London to, to Sibsi in Ballam. Um, and presenting to uh, a couple of retired or, or semi-retired uh, members of academia um, as to the um, my um, engineering practice report, which was um, looking at um, the effect of a, a building's orientation um, and the effect on its energy consumption. So uh, calculating from first principles and verifying that using um, computational fuel dynamics and, and uh, modelling uh, packages and Excel spreadsheets and what have you, um, how much energy that building would consume over the course of a year, given a, a set orientation. Now, I know that we can't always rotate a building to, to optimise its uh, uh, orientation on, on a plot of land. But uh, just for, uh, you know, for, from from theory, theoretical point of view, I thought it was interesting. Um, and the, the, the building that I analysed, I think there was about a 15 to 20 percent uh, difference in the amount of energy it would consume depending on whether it was south facing or east facing or north facing or what have you and I specifically uh, designed the building so that it had different um, glazing ratios on the north and the south facades and east and west facades along with doors and openings and what have you 
um, yeah. we might not be able to physically rotate a building every time, but we can think about treating the different um, orientations differently in terms of glazing and facade, can't we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, uh, it does have an effect. And with the, the likes of Brie Soleil and, and solar transmission glass and glazing and uh, different wall types, you know, uh, they all perform in different ways. And then us as occupants as well can uh, have an effect on, on the building with uh, the clothes that we wear and, you know, um, opening a window if we're too hot or too cold or if it's a bit too stuffy with carbon dioxide and what have you in, in the environment and, you know, falling asleep or, you know, changing our eating patterns so that we don't have that sort of lull or having a big, big lunch at lunchtime, you know, save that for another time of the day so that you don't need a siesta or, or feel like you need it. Absolutely. So like a lot of us, then you get involved with things like the committee because you, you know it's going to be good for progression. You know it's going to be good for the CB. Um, but chair, chair's a lot of effort. Why, why go to that extent? Because you know, I, I, I see you and I see all the, the effort you put in and, and I'm not sure I want to take that on. Yeah, persuade me, Joss. Yeah, what what made you do it? Why 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 might others want to do it in the future? Well, we have spoken about this recently. I, I remember that conversation. But uh, yeah, it, it's just uh, very rewarding and challenging at times. And I think being an engineer, we we always have that um, uh, challenging, uh, uh, inquisitive part of of our mind. So um, the um, the sort of quotes that uh, always tickle me and and the the adages are. Um, the definition of a, 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 an engineer is someone who does precision guesswork based on unreliable data provided by those of questionable knowledge. Um, or an, an engineer is, is somebody who likes to solve problems. And if there aren't any problems handily available, we'll happily create our own. Um, and the only other one that I had was uh, um, that uh, arguing with an engineer is a lot like wrestling in mud with a pig. Uh, after a couple of hours, you realise the pig likes it or enjoys it. So, uh, yeah, it, it's um, it, 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 it's as I say, challenging and rewarding uh, in equal measures. Um, it's uh, it's benefited me by helping me to raise my profile within the the region and the industry, um, and also helped me to grow as an engineer uh, and to experience and get to know a wide range of companies and individuals that I wouldn't necessarily have experienced and learned from without being part of the committee. So, yeah, if, uh, if if anybody else, anybody listening to this or watching this is uh, interested, um, we'd love to chat with you and uh, um, uh, get get you involved even more than you are currently within the region and within the industry. Um, and, yeah, please uh, get in touch with either myself or Chloe or any of the other committee members. And, um, you know, we're, we're not um, uh, signing you up to, to, for a lifelong commitment to things. You know, we will. Um, uh, give you uh, uh, an opportunity to join us before committing. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's not necessarily a, a lifelong commitment to start with. But uh, yeah, if if you're interested, please uh, get in touch, and uh, we'll take it from there together. Absolutely, I think the the networks you end up creating through these things are, are so valuable, um, and and as you say, so rewarding. You know, it's not just you know it's valuable for the CV, but you know, it, this sort of the feel good factor of of knowing the impact you're making and and enjoying the work that you're doing. Yeah, I mean, it's not just about CPD seminars. It's not just about committee meetings. There's, uh, you know, a whole range of things that we can do and we can help you to deliver and, and, and support and uh, help your, your industry peers and colleagues to uh, achieve as well. And, you know, um, finding out about new things, new practices, new new innovation, new sustainability, new energy efficiency techniques. Uh, you know, it might just be a a WhatsApp group where somebody puts something in about a, an interesting article that they've they've seen or, you know, an in passing conversation during a meeting or a committee meeting or a Zoom or a Teams meeting like this. But uh, just uh, piquing that interest and, and going off and then finding out a bit more about it or knowing somebody that you can ask a question of or that's interested in like minded individuals. then uh, yeah, it's uh, it's all good for me. So um, uh, and what about yourself? How did you get involved to start with? Um. Largely because I the the sort of outreach side of things. So I actually was briefly involved in the committee um probably 10 years ago or so, um, before my daughter was born. Um and again it was sort of the education officer type role, but more of more from an outreach perspective um to schools and things. And at the time, um HQ was not great at supporting um the regions to to do that. You know, I, you could see in the journal they, they were writing articles about this outreach stuff they had and then 
you contact them and you just didn't get the support. And I think a huge amount has changed in HQ now. So I've been willing to, to come back and get involved again. Um, and I think, you know, now I'm I'm not in industry anymore. Now I'm in academia. So I've got something different that I can offer to the committee. Um, and I've, I've found that, you know, that's very much been embraced and I've been supported to, to do those things. So um, previous chair Martin um, shared lots of the things he was already doing to help me take little steps into doing them myself. Um, and now that they are mine, I've very much been able to take ownership and, and reshape things. So you know, we now have two different education awards um, that I'm, I'm leading on. And it's great to be able to, to see those sort of changes happen and, and be able to sort of do the things that I'm passionate about in an environment that wants me to be doing those things and rewards them. It's not always, you know, outreach is a funny thing. Not everywhere values it. Yeah. Not everywhere sees that it's it's necessary. So not not at all points in my career have I felt supported to do those things. I've still gone ahead and done them. Just might have been through my annual leave or through flexible working that I've been able to do those things rather than through company support at times. Um, but it's, it's lovely seeing the, the industry change and seeing the committee change and seeing HQ change to be far more supportive of us getting involved with the younger generation because you know, what's the point in us being great engineers and doing great engineering if there's not going to be a next generation to maintain, develop and, and build on what we've done? Yeah. Is there somebody who supported your professional development that you'd like to acknowledge? Oh, absolutely. Um, Colin White, when I was working back at um, WSPCL, was uh, such an amazing mentor for me. I think particularly when we were going through the recession, he was such a champion of making sure I was still, well, still kept my job for one thing, but also, you know, still developed, still given opportunities. And um, he mentored me through getting my CNG as well. So he's been a fantastic supporter throughout. But yeah, joining the committee, like the committee as a whole, but Martin, um, when I first joined, really supportive, really nice bunch to work with. So yeah, lots of lovely people that I've had support from throughout my career. It's it's quite a wide range as you you go from organisation to organisation, or you know committee to committee, or you know as you develop through your career, just uh, getting out in, into meetings and, and meeting people. It, it's uh, quite surprising the the wide range of uh, characters and individuals that you meet. Um, along with the, the 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 variety and depth of um, uh, uh, facets to the M and E banner, uh, a lot of people see M and E mechanical electrical building services as just a a block. When actually you've got everything from ventilation to lighting to power to heating to cooling to public health Six services. Fire. Yeah, uh, you know, and 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 working with uh, architects and civil engineers and project managers and quantity surveyors and you know other engineers and problem solvers such as ourselves you know structural engineers and what have you uh, as you say fire uh, acoustics um you know there, there's uh, building control officers and and, and planning officers and, and regulations and standards uh, it, it's uh, absolutely fascinating and, and challenging in equal measures as to sort of the the industry so uh, yeah um uh, you Talk mentioned a bit about progression um you know of ourselves so where do you see um, the, the industry going? Um, you know, we've talked about how we've developed as engineers, but what's happening with industry? Where do you see building services engineers going in the next 10, 20, 30 years time? Well, uh, I see the, the big challenge at the moment as uh, the, the environment and, and the uh, net zero um, and actually reversing some of the damage that we as uh, human beings have, have done to, to, the, uh, to the world and the environment in which we live. Um, I'm very nervous about uh, putting all of our eggs in one basket when it comes to electricity. Um, but at the moment, I don't see that, uh, that there's an alternative, um, a viable alternative in, for an, an alternative energy source like we are currently using in parts in the form of natural gas. Um, so I'm very interested to see um, sort of the, the heat pump technology um, and developments and innovation in, in, in that marketplace, um, but also uh, alternative fuels like uh, hydrogen um, and also renewable energy sources. So although they may be electrical or electricity based, um, it's uh, generating that electricity from something other than gas or coal or fossil fuels. So, uh, yeah, that, that's um the big challenge I think that we've got as uh, as a as a as a population of the world um, to to do that. Uh, I'm also mindful of the, the size that we are as a country 
Um, and I think we're probably punching above our weight in comparison to the likes of, uh, you know, China, Russia and America. Um, but um, yeah, what we're doing possibly is a drop in the ocean when it comes to, to reversing the, the damage that we've done. But uh, we can certainly be uh, sort of um, front runners and, and um, uh, market leaders when it comes to, to demonstrating uh, what we should be doing as a as a royal we rather than as a just a country or a, a population of a of a country or a region. Absolutely, I mean leadership doesn't have to be about being the person who's actually in charge. You know, we as a country need to to be leading. How do we make things more efficient, more sustainable? Um, because it's it's such a massive issue, and we we don't start improving things. What is the future for for our kids and for their kids? Um, it is a worry. Uh, so I'm totally with you on all of the you know, alternative energy sources and I think on reducing our energy usage as well. You know, you know, things like the what orientation and what glazing on which facade um, to reduce our energy usage. And um, and that's coming as well. Like you, you see more and more things with a, a lower energy consumption. You know, the, think of the changes to lighting over the last decade. Yeah. Uh, moving to LEDs and things like that. It has been huge. Yeah. You mentioned uh, embedding earlier. Um, and with regards to energy efficiency and, and uh, um, those sorts of elements, how do you embed sustainability and renewables into your teaching and energy efficiency as well? Um, absolutely. So, you know, within teaching, I think it's it's so critical that we get the students thinking about these things. Um, and it's it can't be a bolt on. You know, as soon as something is uh, and also at the end, it's easy to forget. And I think that's true of sustainability. It's also true of EDI. It's also true of ethics. Um, so it's got to be an integrated part of the curriculum. So when we're doing things like teaching um, design projects um, or teaching case studies of you, know, here's um, an example of, of the, a power station that we're, we're looking at the, the thermocycles, but we also need to be looking at where's that power station getting its resources from and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's got to be embedded within the curriculum, um, yeah, which is it's, it's hard going because you've got passionate advocates like myself who, you know, I, I teach professional engineering skills and a bit of design and I can I can get things in, in there. But, you know, I think we need to see it all the more in in the, the hard subjects. You know, we, we think about the, the technical um, areas where they're teaching the more pure thermofluids and um, materials and maths and foundational mechanics and that kind of stuff and we need to make sure that we're thinking about all of those things in in the the pure and more technical um subjects rather than always bugging things in the bits that people think of as being soft because some people then don't value them so much and we're currently in the results season with a levels and gcse results is it just degree qualifications that uh, you 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 teach and, and lecture on or is it uh, HNDs and BTECs and various other qualifications too? Uh, so at the moment I'm only teaching degrees although I am currently training to be an endpoint assessor for degree apprenticeships um, through SIBSI um, and obviously through outreach I get involved with with schools and all sorts um, and with the education awards we I go in and speak um, only once or twice a year, but um, I will be going in to speak to some of the colleges in the, the area as well. So many fingers in different pies, but yeah, my, my main focus is absolutely on on degrees. You were at uh, Lionel, uh, Solly Hull with uh, Lionel recently, I hear. Um, yeah, so um, we get involved every year um, as a committee, not necessarily me personally. Um, the dates didn't work out for me this year, actually. Um, but as a committee, we got involved and attended the students' um, final presentations on their projects to give them some industry feedback. I think it's so valuable for industry and academia to have those close ties um, because inherently most academics have spent most of their life in academia. So they don't necessarily know what it is that industry wants and needs from from graduates. So you need to have those close ties so that you get industry feedback going straight to the students so they know how to adapt themselves to fit in to, to industry, how to uh, improve what they're doing. So it's it's industry relevant, not just academia relevant, because I think there can be a disconnect at times. Yeah, I, I um, was able to, to uh, accept Lionel's invitation uh, a few years ago, and it was fascinating uh, seeing the um, students go from, uh, you know, the, the developing them in, in just uh, as little as a year from, uh, you know, where they were to where they are now. Um, but also, you know, 
testing and probing their knowledge and experience uh, on the day uh, and uh, hearing what they've been doing and, and seeing that sort of uh, uh, inquisitive nature and, and minds develop from uh, where, where they were to where they are and um, uh, asking them some uh, probably questions that were, were too advanced for them at the time, but you could still see the cogs whirring in their brains trying to think of the answer or you know what the implications were of uh, you know having uh, um, uh, so a lighting control system that uh, automatically turns off when it doesn't sense any motion within the building or uh, a valve that or a pump that uh, slows down when when the demand's no longer there so you know and the, the energy that's saved uh, associated with that as well so uh, yeah it's really interesting and, and rewarding and and, and uh, a good experience to to be part of that so uh, yeah um Sibzi's recently formed a equality diversity inclusivity panel which i know you're a member of how's the industry's approach to edni changed over the time that you've been part of it um so the industry has you know it's come a long way um early on in my career i would quite often be assumed to be the secretary when you're a a female work, walking into the office uh, for a site meeting or something um or um yeah I had some some quite sexist comments from from on site and from in in the office as well um which I won't repeat um you know, and it was still you know, you'd, you'd walk into a site office and there'd be naked lady calendars which is possibly not ideal for then holding a, a meeting with a woman um so yeah you know, that was where we were um at the start of my career and I, I think it has come a long way, you know, partly the, the more women you get coming through the pipeline, the more people realise it's totally inappropriate to, to say those things. And the more often their assumptions have been challenged, you know, so if someone assumes I'm a secretary and I correct them, they're less likely to say it to the next woman engineer that they meet. So, I, you know, it has been coming along um, sort of naturally. Um, but you've got some real industry leaders, I think, pushing for this. Um, so one of the other um, people on the committee um, is from Kundal, who I used to work for as well. Um, and I think Kundal is one of the, the, the industry leaders pushing for improvements in diversity and inclusion. And I think it's great that you're starting to see more and more proactive policies um, about looking after those with protected characteristics and beyond. You know, I think we can get very focused on it being a checklist um, of, you know, must make sure we equally pay um, women must make sure that we recruit a black person at some point yeah it becomes a checklist and that's that's not helpful um but actually taking that more sort of holistic view um, and policies can very much help with that but i think it's lovely seeing the mindset of industry changing to be like oh yeah maybe i should not make jokes about fat people um yeah. it, it is nice seeing a change and it has come a long way but i think we we are sort of at that point where um the the natural change is is not enough it's not fast enough because the you know seeing the the pay gap you know it's going to still take till something like 27 uh, t till we actually have equal pay if we continue at the rate we're going um so it's great seeing that people like Zibzi have set up a standing committee for edi so this is not something that is a flash in the pan it's not something that's only going to be around for a couple of years this is now a permanent committee of Zibzi to make sure that we're addressing um, equality, diversity and inclusion in the workplace and it, it's just so exciting to see people actually making it a priority. Yeah I, I see in the sports world at the moment we've got quite a lot of cricket going on and, and the uh, 100 series and I, I briefly read a, an article in the news about uh, the, the ladies game having shorter boundaries than the men's game and questioning whether they should be as short as they were um, but uh, when talking about equality as well it's it, uh, reminded me of a family member who was um, uh, so that the ladies game is played over three sets I think was the, the men's game is played over five and she was saying that it's right for the ladies game to not have as higher um, prize pu prize fund because they don't play the same amount of uh, sets and, and the same amount of effort and this was a lady challenging and, and agreeing that the ladies game should be suppressed in comparison to the men's game, whether you agree with that or not, a, another matter. And I'll be interested to have those discussions. But I think what from what you were saying and, and from what I think as well, you know, it shouldn't just be about you calling out other people 
um, putting you know the the uh, page three or uh, you know the the uh, questionable um, content uh, out there or or uh, the, you know the discriminatory remarks. It's it's about all of us to to start and continue calling that out where we see something that we make us think oh that that's not quite right then we need to say something about it and you know uh, stand up and, and emphasize and, and and continue because if we were all identical in the in the uh, workplace or, or uh, education sphere then we'd all be thinking the same thing and I think having though that that uh, diversity and, and range of viewpoints and experiences and and uh, knowledges uh, adds to um, what we do uh, in the in, in the industry uh, and can only benefit us so uh, yeah I, I'm all for it so uh, yeah thank you for that. Well there's loads of data that shows that more diverse um, teams are able to produce more profit in the long run so you know even if you don't give two hoots about gender equality racial equality lgbt safe spaces whatever else it's just in your financial interests to to embrace diversity and, and therefore call out things that you know make marginalized communities not want to be part of the industry so yeah absolutely straight white male able-bodied allies you are our heroes please get on it and start calling people out <laughs> Um, what's the biggest area you're curious about currently and why? Um, presumably in building services industry. Um, yeah. uh, I, I continue to be really excited about wellbeing. I think, you know, obviously sustainability is important, but we kind of, we, we built momentum on that. It's going, um, people are doing good stuff. Um, and like, you, there's new stuff coming out about it all the time, but wellbeing, I think is a little bit further behind, um, but it's definitely on the rise and it's something that's really exciting to see that we are you know, designing our, our workplaces, our homes, our schools to be somewhere that makes our occupants better, more um, involved, more belonging, more healthy compared to places that induce things like sick building syndrome. And you know, we've got to put a roof over your head and make sure it's not raining on you. But other than that, we don't really care. <laughs> Go home with headaches. You know, the, the the change again in industry's attitudes to to the occupants of the buildings rather than purely on on the profits and the costs to build and things like that I think is is really refreshing to see um, and again gives me, me hope for for what workplaces and and homes are going to be like um, yeah, for, I, for the rest that, of the future that that uh, homes piece with the advent of COVID and and working from home and working remotely uh, I think uh, the workplace had. had has and is still changing massively and uh, I'm, I'm excited to, to see where it goes because uh, you know it, it's not necessarily being strapped to a desk nine to five when you do your best work and not everybody is a nine to five person so with mobile phones and emails and, and messaging uh, applications then uh, it's very easy to to uh, communicate what what you need to whenever you need to it's interesting. I was um, I've just come off two weeks of holiday and whilst on holiday, I sprained my ankle. Um, yeah. So I spent one of my days of holiday sat on the sofa, at which point I was like, well, I'm the only person in the house because everyone else is off out continuing their holidays. So why would I want this to be a day of annual leave? So instead, I got out my phone and started replying to my emails. So, you know, I've done a day of work whilst sitting on the sofa in Scotland, overlooking Holy Isle with, you know, watching the gannets dive. But been able to get a day of work done and you know claw back some annual leave for another time so yeah. i do think you know flexible working and, and the ability to work remotely is is really exciting you, you didn't consider reading a book or uh, listening to a podcast or vlog or you know catching up on a box set of some sort uh well you know by this point we're 10 days into the holiday i've done quite a lot of reading and uh uh not a lot of TV actually. I had barely any screen time over the holiday, but yeah, uh, cross stitch is um, my relaxing vice. Uh, okay. So I've done quite a lot of that already. So I was I was ready to 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 claw back my my annual leave and answer some emails. Yeah, I think uh, having that uh, away time from uh, you know electronic devices, uh, mobile phones, laptops, screens, what have you, you know, is really valuable. But um, mental health wise, how do you stay positive both inside and out of the workplace? I think it's such an important thing. I think mental health has become so key. You know, in academia, we've seen rates of of the students needing mental health support go up hugely. Um, obviously, with COVID, that that made a big difference, but it was already on the rise. You know, um, I think life just got more stressful. 
Um, social media doesn't help with it. Like the pressure, you know, the, we've just talked about how great it is to be able to do remote working and be able to access your emails anytime. Um, but actually that means for some people that they are accessing, accessing their emails at all times and they are thinking about work or exams or study or uh, whatever at all times. So I think it's really important to have that disconnect. Um, and for me, um, as I've just mentioned, cross stitch. So you know, I commute down to London um, most days of the week um, during term time, university term time. So I spend my time on the train um, with a an audio book in my ears um, and doing some cross stitch. And I just find that that mindfulness um, a really good way of decompressing and and disconnecting from the working day. Um, but I also find that you know doing at least some things in your job that you feel excited about and proud about really helps. Um, so for me, that's part of why I, I moved into academia, because I found that the teaching side really rewarding. I find working with the next generation really rewarding. So doing those things, I think, helps. Um, and, and seeing the value in the things that you do and enjoy outside of work. You don't have to be, um, you know, a workaholic you know, who on their deathbed goes, I regret not getting that report in on time. You know, they're saying I regret not going on that holiday or not going, spending more time with my kid. Like, do the things that you enjoy and make you happy and excited. Um, and I know that's easier said than done. I think um, there's a yeah. lot of pressure to work more hours. With, with the advent of uh, working from home, I particularly struggle with um, switching from uh, work to home life. Um, and I think that journey from one to the other, transitioning from one mask to another, maybe, or, or one persona, um, and, and having that time to adjust, you know, like you say, listening to audio books or, or music or the radio or, you know, uh, Kindles or reading or whatever you do or, or driving, you know, concentrating on driving and, and just having the background noise of, of the road and, and, the, and the radio in the background, maybe ideally not using the mobile phone, but um, yeah, there's there's a lot to be said for that transition from one to the other. Um, so yeah, um, when work. How do you home, recreate that when you're working from home? It's challenging, isn't it? So whether it's you know maybe going out for a walk between I've decided my working day is done and I'm going to start my home day, so I'm just going to walk around the block or go and do the school run, um, or even just I'm going to go into the bedroom and get changed. Different, yeah, different outfit. You know, there's lots of different ways you, you can do it, but I think yeah, creating a transition between the two can be really helpful. Yeah, it doesn't really work when you're wearing a, a shirt or, a you know, something smart on your top half and, and uh, uh, lounge suit and slippers on your bottom half. But uh, yeah, I, what I know what you What are you trying to say about the denim shorts I'm wearing? Well, uh, I, I'm pleased to say that uh, I'm in a shirt and trousers today, <laughs> honestly. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I know what you mean when uh, yeah, just having that time to, to change clothes or, or change your, your frame of mind from one to the other. Um, it is uh, is challenging for me, um, and I'm, I'm improving. Uh, you know, I'm not there yet personally, but uh, yeah, I think that that's part of the the challenge of of COVID and, and working remotely and working from home. I find um, it weirdly beneficial to leave a house and come back in again, even if it's just standing in the garden for two minutes, you know, topping up the bird feeder, anything. Just uh, it's almost like by leaving the house, I've left my workplace, and then by coming back into the house, I've entered my home. It's the same building. I've only been outside for 30 seconds, but you know, leaving and coming back again, I think that would be my top tip for people who are struggling with the, well, the work you, from home. You can go for hours or you know, days on end without actually leaving the house, what with the uh, home deliveries and what have you. Um, so yeah, um, getting that uh, connection to outside uh, is, is, is very useful. Um, what do you think the future holds for building services engineers? I think there's a, a lot. Um, like, I think we're going to be an increasingly important discipline. I think historically, you know, I was mentioning that I'd never heard of what building services engineer was during my degree. Um, and I think a lot of the population, you only know about building services engineers when the building services has gone wrong. Um, so I think that that's going to cease to be the case. I think you know, how our buildings, particularly, you know, all these heat waves we've had, everyone's now talking about air conditioning in their houses. Um, you know, with COVID, everyone's talking about improved ventilation, whether that's at home, whether it's at work, whether it's at school. Um, building services, unfortunately, for bad, bad uh, contextual reasons like COVID and heat waves, but I think it's become more visible, more important, more talked about. Um, so hopefully, it's going to be a more um, respected, well-known, 
aspirational um, profession. Um, and certainly the things that I see going on it are are all those things. You know, I, I'm I'm so in awe of all the people who are doing amazing work with sustainability and innovation and well-being and um, all the sort of research that's going on as well, um, not just in academia, but also within companies. Like there's there's amazing stuff going on. Um, and I think um, the more we can share that stuff, the more we can shout about it um, and help people to, to live uh, more enjoyable lives through having better ventilated, better air conditioned homes. And I think it's all going to be a nice little positive loop where we'll be able to have a more positive impact and then more people will want to be us or want to employ us. Um, so I think it's going to be a real um, a career of the future that more people will want to have and want to employ. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people know exactly what architects do and, and what structural engineers do. Um, but yeah, I think um, with um, uh, indoor air quality um, and um, you know everything that you mentioned previously um, the, the role of building services engineers is coming through uh, to the forefront because of the uh, uh, indoor environment uh, and the work that we can do to influence that um, whilst minimizing the impact on the world so uh, yeah um, well thank you very much for joining us today Chloe and for sharing what you have uh, just a couple of last questions if I may um, what do you like to do in your spare time other than cross stitch? <laughs> I love to wild swim. So if I can find myself a body of water that I can get in, um, it's hard to keep me out at times. So, you know, just come back from Scotland, as I mentioned, um, I was in the sea there. That was a bit chilly. Um, but I'll, I swim in rivers throughout winter. So the cold doesn't bother me. Um, but I just find it's such a great way of um, giving your mind a, a wash. Yeah, you know, it's impossible when you're in a, a cold river or the sea to think about anything other than the the present moment. Um, so it's great to get out of it and feel very refreshed and no longer burdened with worries and things. Um, yeah, and yeah. I also love to play board games. OK, we've um, we've got a lake close to us called Alderford Lakes, and I was interested to see a, a flotation device that uh, you put your keys and your uh, mobile phone and what have you in there. I was trying to search for them online. Is there a technical term for that, or is there uh, what, what search term should I be using for that device? It's a tow float, T O W, not T O E. Um, okay. I've got several. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. absolutely. You can, they come in various forms, and you can stick your keys in. If it's big enough, you can put a towel in it, wrap it up, inflate it. Barely notice it's there when you're swimming, but not only have you got a safe place for your keys and things, um, but you're making yourself visible to other uh, water users, so particularly useful if you're somewhere where there's also boats. Um, and if you get into problem, you know, it's a flotation device, you've got something you can hold on to to help yourself um, stay above water if you're starting to struggle. Tow float, excellent, I'll, um, I'll look for that. Not that I'm going to start, you know, throwing myself into wetsuits and flippers and- Wetsuits, you know. wetsuits, just get in there in your swimsuit. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned board games. I would love to know what your favorite board game is. Um, probably Monopoly, but um, we're not allowed to play it in my household or my parents' household because of the um, conflict that's caused towards the end of the game. Um, so the, the, the game that I do particularly like playing at the moment is a game called Rummy Cub. Um, it's a numbers game. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with it, but um, uh, I'm uh, sort of trying to persuade my eight-year-old son to join us um, but uh, yeah my 11-year-old uh, daughter took great pleasure in uh, beating us whilst we were uh, away on leave recently and she managed to beat us uh, well she manages and managed to, to beat us on multiple games in a row um, so it wasn't just a, a one-off you know quirk she she is uh, generally good at it so uh, yeah Rummy Cub um, you have to um, create sequences of numbers uh, either the same number using different colours of tiles or the same colour in a in a sequence in a, in a, a straight using a poker analogy or a card game analogy. Um, and then there's a couple it's of like jokers. Like Scrabble and whist, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, for, for, for any ages, uh, my parents came across it when they were on a, a train journey somewhere and another family on another table were playing it and they they they, they thought it was uh, sounded interesting what they were doing and uh, so yeah we've now got a travel version and the full version of it so uh, yeah we uh, fairly regularly have uh, have games of that so uh, yeah it's all good 
Yeah, I'm not a fan of Monopoly because I don't like a game that um, you know often who's won quite a long time before the actual end. Um, I like a game that is short, so it doesn't matter if you lose, or that is cooperative, so you will win or lose together, or where for some reason it's very hard to know who's actually won to the end. So there's quite a few games where there's a secret bonus card, for example, that changes the point score right at the very end. I like that sort of thing. Well, we were looking at getting Cluedo as well. It's been ages since I played that. Um, yeah, and I sort of forget the rules on that as well, and I, I can't quite in, in, uh, visualise how, how it works out. But uh, Cluedo's good fun, and if you like Cluedo, um, I thoroughly recommend Dixit. Um, Dixit is a bit like playing Cluedo, except that um, one of you is um, the ghost, and everyone else are the um, detectives, and the ghost communicates with you through beautiful artwork cards and you've got to guess from the artwork which which of these is the murder weapon or which of these is the killer um, or whatever so it's a cooperative game as I mentioned I love those um, and it, it's got lovely artwork and I, it's quite child friendly. Cool um, and, and lastly for me uh, where can people connect with you um, afterwards or after this? Um, so I am can be found on Twitter uh, at, at Geek Chloe um, but you can also get me um, via email. Um, I think my email address is accessible on the Sibsey uh, West Midlands region e uh, website, so you'll be able to find me there as well. How about and, you, Joss? And, and LinkedIn as well, I guess. I am on LinkedIn, yes. So Chloe Ag. Um, with an unusual surname, I'm easy to find. Well, with, with uh, unusual names, yeah, I'm in a, in a similar boat. But uh, yeah, for me, it's, uh, it's Twitter, it's email. Um, it's uh, WhatsApp, it's LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, uh, Brownlee is a, a relatively, uh, and that's L-I-E, not uh, L-E-E -E as the um, uh, runners and athletes are. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, all good there. And, you know, emails and, and websites and, uh, you know, podcasts and blogs and what have you. So yeah. So excellent. Well, as I previously said, thank you very much for joining and sharing with us what you have today. Uh, if you'd like to share your thoughts or contact us, please don't hesitate to get in, uh, to, to get in contact. Also, if you'd like to feature in future episode or know or can think of somebody that you'd like to find out more about or is an inspiration to you, then please get in touch. Please like, comment and share. And we look forward to the next episode of the Sibsey West Midlands Fleet Region vlog and podcast. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>